I have volunteered for a one-way mission to Mars. I have volunteered to spend the next 10 years of my life training and preparing so that I might have the opportunity to say goodbye to family, to friends, to everything I have ever known on this Earth, and venture deeper into the solar system to a cold, desolate planet where I would live out the rest of my days. And how do I feel about volunteering for such a mission? Just fine. <laughs> a little bit excitable sometimes, but mostly just fine. Because Mars is there to be explored. We've landed rovers successfully on its surface. Sending people there looks possible. The only reason we haven't tried is because currently there is no way of bringing people back. The technology does not yet exist to launch something from the surface of Mars and have it land safely back on Earth. And that's why Mars One, the not-for-profit space exploration organization, have designed a mission that uses only existing technology that already works on Earth, and have looked for volunteers to embark on a one-way trip to establish the first permanent human settlement on Mars. Colonizing Mars would be the next giant leap for humankind, the next challenge in our quest to understand our nearest neighboring planet, the next frontier in our bid to become a multi-planetary species. My own reason for volunteering is simple. I'm a scientist, an astrophysicist, and there's nothing I find more fascinating than observing the birth and death of stars, of seeing how they form and explode and evolve over distances and timescales that we can barely fathom, of beholding our own insignificance when faced with the vast beauty of the cosmos. So to have the chance to be part of a scientific endeavor that could one day help us to understand our place in the universe a little bit better is an opportunity that I could never turn down. At this point, I can only imagine how my future might unfold in front of me. If selected for the mission, I would spend eight years in astronaut training, preparing for the challenges of journeying to and surviving on a hostile planet, so that in 10 years' time, I could be all set to leave the planet. I would spend my training with three other crewmates, seeing how we live in close confinement. This would culminate in training in the most remote regions on the Earth, places like Antarctica, where being cut off from the rest of the world would be the best simulation of the isolation we would endure on Mars. And in those 10 years, in 2024, we'd be set for launch. I could be commencing a seven-month journey to Mars, and immediately, my body would start to change. The first thing I would have to deal with would be the constant weightlessness. I could experience nausea, because when you can float upside down without the blood rushing to your head, there is no longer any physical sensation to let you know your orientation. There is no up or down. Without the downward pull of gravity to circulate the blood in the lower part of my body, it would spread equally throughout to my head, where it would cause congestion and give my face that puffy look that astronauts always have on the International Space Station. But that's just the short-term effects. Long-term, because my body would not have to bear its own weight against gravity, my muscle mass would decrease, my bones would weaken, the vertebrae in my back would stretch out, causing my spine to lengthen and making me grow two inches taller. This could cause me immense discomfort, but I think any pain would be offset by the satisfaction of fulfilling some of my lifelong dreams, of getting to travel in space, of getting to view the whole of the Earth from a distance, sure, but most importantly, of finally being six feet tall. <laughs> I would have 80 cubic meters of space to share with three other crewmates. That's about the equivalent of two buses, which sounds like a lot, but occasionally we would find ourselves huddling in a small sheltered part of the ship for several days when a solar storm occurs. These periodic eruptions from the surface of the sun are to be expected. And without the protection provided to us on Earth by the atmosphere, we would have to take refuge in a compact radiation-shielded part of the ship. And after seven months of living on this ship, of using wet wipes instead of showering, of exercising three hours a day just to try and reduce the loss of muscle mass, I think I would be ready to embrace my new home. Arriving on Mars, my body would once again have to adjust to the strain of a planet's gravity. Although gravity on Mars is less than half what we experience on Earth, it would still be enough to virtually incapacitate me after months traveling through space. Luckily, there would be a working, living environment already on Mars before I even leave Earth. Demonstration missions, communication satellites, robotic rovers, 
would all reach Mars in the years prior to the manned mission. The robotic rovers, every bit as adorable and loyal as some of the other rovers roaming the surface of Mars, would help us find the ideal location for a settlement. Close to resources, plenty of natural light, unlimited road frontage. <laughs> everything you could ever want in a new home. They would find somewhere flat enough for building, somewhere close enough to the north that there would be sufficient ice in the soil for us to reclaim water, but close enough to the equator that we could achieve maximum solar power, which would be our main energy source. After I've regained my strength, I would join my crewmates and our trusty rovers in expanding the colony. These life support modules you see here are not only responsible for recycling the water, but would provide a breathable atmosphere which would be pumped into an inflatable living component, which would then be covered with layers of Martian soil to protect it from radiation. Inside the living component, we would have bedrooms, living areas, working areas, and even space to grow our plants. Life on Mars would consist of building and maintaining our habitat, as well as continuous scientific research, both on ourselves and on the environment. Let's jump forward 20 years and see how I'm doing. At this point, I would like to think I would have adjusted to life on Mars. The length of day and night on Mars is comparable to Earth. It's one of the most subtle but vital similarities in helping us foresee people adjusting to life there. Inside the living environment, I could hope to lead a somewhat typical day-to-day -day life. I could shower as normal, harvest and eat fresh food, wear regular clothes, watch TV, work out in the gym, and carry out my scientific experiments. Outside the living environment, I would have to wear a protective suit to breathe and to survive the freezing temperatures. I would have to limit my time outside to about six hours per week due to radiation exposure. Dust particles suspended in the thin atmosphere would give the sky a reddish glow, and longing for Earth would be inevitable. When you stand on the surface of Mars, looking up, the Earth looks just like another star. We could communicate with Earth through a communication satellite in Martian orbit. There's a three and a half minute communication delay both ways, so having live conversations with people on Earth would be unlikely. But I could keep in touch with family and friends using video messages, email, even WhatsApp. Which would be nice, because that's actually the main method of communication I have with my family on this planet. <laughs> it's what I use to tell them that I've made it through to the next round of the selection process. I don't know why I always refer to myself in the third person when I'm talking to my family, but you know, sometimes I do. Well, people often ask me what my family think of my desire to go to Mars. And you can see from my siblings' responses, their support is unconditional. I'm the youngest in my family, and the truth is, they would support me on anything I am passionate about, even if they're not always sure what I'm up to. <laughs> 30 years from now, and at this point, I would like to think I would have adjusted to life on my new planet, and I've helped to solve some of the mysteries on Mars. Helped to tell us more about its past, its relationship with Earth, and to find any clues to tell us about what might happen to either planet in the future. Collaborating with scientists on Earth to help us understand our place in the universe would be immensely gratifying for me. And I could imagine that in those years, I would reflect back on my early career and remember how people used to react to my youthful enthusiasm for science. I could remember how people sometimes would be confused by how passionate I am about explaining things like the physics of the early universe and the Big Bang, to the point that sometimes they think I'm actually speaking about something entirely more lewd. <laughs> it probably could have been worse. At this point, our colony would have achieved a higher level of self-sufficiency. I would have grown accustomed to my diet of insects and plants. I would have helped to expand the colony with the arrival of more crews from Earth. But something I would have to face is the inevitability that as people grow old, they would face health concerns. Some of the crew would have, would have been given comprehensive medical training, but eventually, someone would reach the end of their life on Mars. And that would be traumatic. In fact, the only thing I can think of that would be more difficult to deal with on Mars is the feeling of helplessness when the people I love most on this Earth need me most, and I'm not there. Not being at my family's side when my parents are dying, knowing that they're on their deathbed on a different planet. I can only imagine they would be the darkest days I would have to live through on Mars. But as unbearable as that might be, 
my actions, what I do in those situations would not be left up to chance. Since we have started to explore space, we have always had plans in place and structures to guide us in case the worst were to happen. These include the International Space Treaties, the first of which in 1967 is my favorite. The Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies. This eloquent basis forms all of international space law. It limits the use of space to peaceful purposes, and together with subsequent treaties, sets out the legal framework for our responsibilities in space. It is the most human thing in the world, on any world, to sometimes not be in full control of our emotions. But it is also a defining trait of our humanity that we plan what to do when those situations arise. Forty years from now, and you're probably thinking to yourself, if I even managed to live that long, I'd probably be doing well. And maybe you're right, but this is my idealized hypothetical vision of the future, and I can live as long as I want. <laughs> Who knows what we might have accomplished on Mars by then? There would be no attempt to have children on Mars until their safety can be guaranteed. But after years of studying how the human body responds and adapts to life on Mars, perhaps you might be in a position to do so. I think the single most important thing that could come from this endeavor is that by striving for a future where people can live independently on two planets, we help ensure the continued survival of the human race. But despite my optimism, I would have to acknowledge that if I lived that long, I would probably be facing the final years of my own life. And trying to envisage how someone confronts their own mortality on this planet is difficult. But trying to imagine that process on another planet borders on impossible. It gets even more complicated when we consider that if I manage to live that long, perhaps the one-way aspect of the mission might no longer apply. If NASA or ESA or one of the other space agencies achieves their goal of creating technology needed for the return trip. And if I were to face that crossroads in my life at that time, what would I choose to do? If I was standing on the surface of Mars looking at the sunset, which is smaller and less bright than on Earth, but equally beautiful, would I be so keen to leave? Earth would have changed. My body would have adjusted somewhat to life on Mars, and perhaps it might not be so easy for me to return to the planet of my birth. I would have to think about how I identify with the planet on which I live. And it might not be me. It probably won't be me, but it will be somebody. One way or another, someone of this Earth in the not-too-distant future will come to think of Mars as home. Thank you.